If y'all could come in and take a seat, that would be awesome. Um, if anybody, if you guys want, we have bottled water, um, sodas, snacks over on the table, so grab something now if you'd like. It's, I have it right on the screen. So. Okay. All right, so y'all can feel free to grab um, food or drinks throughout the program. Uh, the restrooms, of course, are down the hall. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the Summer Symposium in Applied Economics. I am Dr. Katie Sharon, um, and I am the director of the Masters in Applied Economics program. I am so uh, proud of our students today. Uh, this marks really a year of work by our students. They've completed these projects over the past 12 weeks, but they've used the skills that they've used throughout this one year terminal master's program. Um, they will graduate a week from today. Uh, most of them will enter the labor force at being a terminal program. Um, a lot of them have jobs lined up. A lot of them are, um, or some of them are still looking. We did give them, if you guys can see on their name tags, I know a lot of you are employers here today and you're looking to hire out of the program. The students that have a green dot on their name tags are still looking for uh, a position and would um, really like to talk to you guys more. Um, so in your folder, you will see the executive summaries um, which is a two-page summary of each of the, of the team's reports, uh, of the team's findings. You'll also see the program for the day, and you will see a QR code. So the QR code will take you to the link for judging, which I'll talk about here in a minute. The password, unfortunately, there's a typo in the password on the piece of paper in front of you. I do have it correct up on the um, screen here. So the password is M-A-E-P. The password is M-A-E-P 2022. And let me just go ahead and put that up for us. So this one up here is correct, M-A-E-P 2022. So I do apologize for that error. And you're welcome to, you know, you can click on that and go, go ahead and open it if you want to at any time. You can exit and go back into it if you want. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. All right, so today um, our, we have six presentations, each of the teams of three will have 30 minutes and we'll have a 15 minute presentation and then we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes of question and answer um, then we'll have a so we'll, we'll have three of the teams present then we'll have a brief break and then we'll have the last three teams present and then at the end of this this is really I mean the last thing that the students have to do before they graduate for most of them um, then we'll have a reception so we'll have a drinks out here, we'll have food in the back, and what we'll do is we'll let everybody get something to eat and drink. Uh, we'll, we're gonna tally the, the votes from judging, then we'll call everybody back in, and we will present awards. So there will be two awards that we're gonna present today. We're gonna do award for outstanding student, and then we're gonna do, which we have chosen as faculty members, and then we're going to do um, an award for outstanding project, best applied project, and you will choose that today. So our program has numerous contribu contributors um, that make today possible and make the program possible. Uh, so this is, a, this is a professional program. This is a one-year terminal master's degree. Uh, in some other schools, the master's uh, in economics is um, something that the students get along their way to a PhD program. This is a professional program, an applied economics program designed to train 
professional economists um, in one year and we get them out into the labor force, most of them. Some of them do to decide to continue on their education. Um, but we, we can offer them scholarships, which is unusual for a, um, for a terminal program, for a professional program. Um, we also have, so a lot of our students have scholarships. Uh, we also have a dedicated computer lab for the students, for just our master's students. Um, they have all kinds of amazing software in there. The computers were replaced just this past spring. Um, and this is thanks to, of course, our, the Call Foundation and the Holcomb family. Uh, the, uh, the students also have a dedicated conference room and a, a shared workspace where they practice their presentations, they meet with our senior partners, um, and they collaborate on group work throughout the year in the program. Um, thank you to our economics faculty. Uh, Dr. Semakina is here, she teaches econometrics. Dr. Paul Beaumont is here, he teaches both data analysis and financial economics, and then our senior partners up front, uh, Dr. John Hammond, Dr. Carl Kitchens, and Dr. Jerry Parrish. Uh, everybody that I've just mentioned is a full-time faculty member in the department, uh, save Jerry Parrish, who is our adjunct in the department, and he's served our department and served our students for years now. 10 years now, um, and so he's, he's actually a very active member in the, community, in the community who wears a lot of different hats. He has his PhD in economics, and he brings to us especially, um, helps f uh, foster the community partnerships that we have, and brings us really good um, uh, project ideas, so we're very appreciate, appreciative of him. Um, thank you so much to our staff, Julie Phillips especially, Justin, and, um, Oh, Rebecca Sage, who is not here right at the moment, but I've spent so many hours in their office, uh, this offices this past year, and I really appreciate all the time that they've put into our students and the program. Um, thank you so much to our alumni. Uh, I love seeing you guys, um, especially the students that, the graduates, you're not students anymore, um, but the, the alumni that return and they, they help develop our students, they help get them ready for the labor force. Um, it's, it's really a testament to the master's program that they are willing to come back to Bellamy especially and give of their time and, ta and talent so, so selflessly. Um, and part of it is because they want to hire out of our program. Um, be, and they were hired out of our program. So it's really, you know, a chain effect and we, we just love developing and, and fostering those relationships. And then our community partners. Um, I, I thought, you know, when I started the directorship in the fall um, and started to plan our first fall career day alongside my colleague, uh, Ms. Taylor Leverett, I thought I was gonna have a hard time um, you know, getting alumni back and getting communi community partners back to help conduct mock interviews and, um, and work with the students, you know, and, and go over their resumes and, and to help us out and prepare them for the professional world. And my inbox is, I, you know, I, I receive lots of emails of people, you know, wanting to work with our students and wanting to help our students and just, and wanting again to hire out of the program and I appreciate that so much. The Master's in Applied Economics program. So the students have been with us for a year. They've been in the, in the program since August. Um, they have taken core courses. So it's an economics program. So they take a two course applied micro sequence. They take econometrics, again with Dr. Semakina. Uh, they take data analysis with Dr. Paul Beaumont, um, which includes a forecasting component. So they, we teach them economic theory. In each of the classes though, we not only teach them economic theory, uh, we teach them how to apply that theory to real world scenarios. So there's a huge data analysis component of our program. The students can gather data on their own. So we hear from so many firms and organizations that they just have a ton of data and it's sitting on a server, on a server somewhere and no one knows how to use it. The students know how to talk to that server, get off the server what they want, um, to parse it, to clean it, to aggregate it, and to massage it and get it to answer the questions that they're trying to answer. Um, they can also comb data off a web page. 
uh, they have programming experience. So we're hearing from employers that they want somebody that has experience not only with the academic programs, which we use, which are STATA and SAS, but the students have exposure to R, to SQL. They've, depending on their capstone project, they've had experience with Tableau, with ArcGIS, with presenting in Canva. Um, and then a lot of the students also have worked in REMI and IMPLAN, um, which are economic analysis tools, um, and Python. Uh, we are just, we're so grateful for all of our partners that, you know, provide these tools to us and that we are able to offer these things to our students. Um, during their two credit hour professional development course, again, our alumni and our, our community partners come and they help us. Um, the students, as their resume changes right throughout the program, they get feedback on, the, on their resume and they help to tailor it and they help know, you know, what to include, what to exclude, you know, how to make it look better for specific employers and for the varying job market. Um, they each have participated in four mock interviews, some face-to-face -face and some even remote. Our program is being live streamed actually, which is wonderful. Um, we are really happy to be back face to face this year, um, but people that cannot attend in person are, are watching us on YouTube and that's really exciting. Um, and then they have practice presenting. You guys will see, I mean, they are, they are polished, they are well prepared. They start practicing their presentations, they start practicing presenting and watching themselves in the fall and they continue practicing presenting throughout the year and especially this summer. The class of 2022, so I have uh, been assistant director of the Applied Masters in Economics program uh, for some years. This was my first year as uh, director. Um, and so this class, of course, will also be, will always have a very, very special place in my heart as my first class that I've um, been their director. We're very happy we were able to offer them two brand new electives this year, uh, financial economics and machine learning, uh, which is in very high demand. 90% um, of our students have internships, have had internships that they've been able to put on their resumes. Um, a lot of our students, you know, they start by coming to my office in the fall, you know, worried about, you know, midterm exams, final exams, you know, I, I don't know how I'm gonna, you know, finish this class, you know, and then I get, you know, about this time of year, even in the spring, I get, you know, emails and I get, you know, knocks on my office door saying, I have multiple job offers, can you help me figure this out? You know, how do I, how do I delicately, um, you know, talk to somebody about wanting more time um, to make a decision? And that is incredibly um, rewarding and I'm extremely proud of them. Um, we have placements at uh, and internships at the Florida Chamber, uh, Charles Rivers Associates, Intermusculoskeletal Care, uh, the Agency for Healthcare Administration, the Energy Authority, and Kimley Horn and Associates. The applied projects. So what you're going to see today, like I've like I've said, is they've been working on these applied projects for 12 weeks. So this 12-week academic summer term. Um, You'll see the AERG logo on the executive summaries and you'll see it on their presentations. So we act as a mock consulting firm. The students are the analysts in the consulting firm and each of the teams is paired with a senior partner. A huge thank you again to Dr. Hammond, Dr. Kitchens, and Dr. Parrish who have worked as senior partners. We like to explain the senior partnership as the bumpers in the bowling alley, so we just make sure that the students stay on track. But the research and the results that you guys are going to see are the students' own. So this is their work. We've guided them, but this is their work. Um, some of the research projects that you guys are see, will see, we do, uh, well, the faculty members, we've, you know, come up with ideas and we've, you know, made sure that there's something that the students can tackle in the 12-week period. And some of the projects that you'll see, we have community partners. So our community partners come through us throughout the year and they say, hey, we have this idea, we don't have, we don't know how to, to answer this question. 
or we don't have the resources to answer this question. How do we go about tackling this? And then we have clients that we work with um, in order to you know, help people with these economic projects and help answer these questions. Um, unlike my dissertation, this stuff gets disseminated. Um, people read these reports, they get widely circulated. Um, if you are interested in reading the report, they are on our, our webpage, the FSU Economics uh, Master's webpage. Um, but I know, like, I was at a presentation just yesterday in the Department of, uh, of Education, and um, their report's going to be, you know, given to legislatures, given to stakeholders, um, because people care about it. And it's something, a question that people want, people have wanted answered for a while, and, you know, it just took our team to, to answer it. Um, okay, judging. So, again, I apologize for the misprint in the program. This is the correct password. Um, the QR code will scan in your program. The correct password is MAEP2022, all one word, all lowercase. Um, the project judges, uh, so we ask if, if you're planning to attend all six presentations today, we would like to invite you to be a, a judge of the projects. Um, we just ask that you attend all six presentations. You don't have to, you know, have an uh, economic background. Um, we are asking parents uh, and other guests, you know, partners of our students to recuse themselves from voting. Um, but we do, we are grateful to have everybody here today. Um, please judge them on their content uh, and their findings as well as their presentation. So we'll have the reception at the end. I'll let you all get something to eat and drink, then I'll call you back in, we'll tally the results, and then we will have the awards presentation for the uh, winning applied project. And this will come with a $2,400 scholarship. Um, yeah, so with, I guess without, without anything further, I would like to introduce our, our first group here, uh, Jackson County. Thank you guys, you guys can come on up. All right, thank you, Dr. Sharon, for your kind remarks, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. My name is Abigail Morgan, and these are my colleagues, William Stevenson and Mike Margolis, and we'd like to welcome you to Jackson County. Nestled in between the borders of Alabama and Georgia, Jackson is a rural county known for its natural beauty, rich history, and burgeoning distribution industry. 
Jackson's County seat, the city of Mariana, is home to Florida's only publicly accessible air-filled caverns, as well as a 907,000 square foot family dollar distribution facility, both of which are major contributors to the local e economy as well as the labor force. But there's still plenty of room for growth. Jackson County has hired AERG to help quantify this potential for growth through the Endeavor Project. In 2018, Jackson County was granted 1,300 acres of land by the state of Florida on the site of the former Dozier School for Boys. The county intends to use this land, which they've dubbed Endeavor Park, to help spur economic development and promote industry expansion. However, the county is currently experiencing a halt in industry expansion due to the lack of attainable housing to support their growing workforce. Pictured here is Endeavor Park. It's located just north of I-10 in close proximity to the city of Mariana. The large brown section on the north campus of our parcel is where the county intends to construct a 750-acre industrial park. The gray triangular region in the center of the parcel is primarily zoned for commercial development. We are focused on the green T-shaped region, 300 acres of which have been zoned for residential development However, only 190 of these acres can be built upon due to the remaining 110 acres being covered by wetlands. AERG has been tasked with providing the county with potential solutions and allocations for this 190 acres of land with a focus on providing attainable workforce housing. Attainable workforce housing is defined as housing that is affordable to those who make between 60 and 120% of the area median income. We provide the fiscal and economic impacts of each of our scenarios in our analysis, as well as the resulting new workforce expansion. In order to better understand the county's needs, we examined the dynamics of each of the markets that our analysis would be impacting, the housing market and the labor market. Jackson County currently has a labor shed of over 23,000 people. This is the total number of people who live and work within Jackson County, as well as the inflow and outflow of workers from outside of the county. We found that around 6,500 people work within the county but do not live there. Attainable workforce housing would lower the cost of living, allowing for a labor shed transfer of people who live outside of the county to move into the county where they already have jobs. Conversely, about 9,500 people live inside of the county but do not currently work there. Through industry expansion, we would see a growth in employment opportunities that would allow for these people to find jobs where they already live. Currently, only 7,438 people both live and work in Jackson County. Our goal is to see a convergence of this figure towards a greater proportion of the labor shed both living and working in Jackson County. If we see a rise in the workforce, as well as new residents moving into the county, then the local government is going to see a rise in their tax base. The new residents will spend their tax dollars in the local economy, and that will further economic expansion. Now my colleague Will is going to walk you through the housing market in Jackson County. Thank you, Abigail. Now I'm gonna walk you guys through the housing supply of Jackson County and see if any of the characteristics of it are attributing to this housing affordability issue. After looking through the Florida Department of Revenue property tax data, we found that roughly 76% of households in Jackson County are considered single family home, 23% are mobile home, and around 1% of households in Jackson County are considered multifamily home. If we take a closer look at the most popular housing option in Jackson County, we find that single family homes have a median price of $140,000, around 1,800 square feet, and sitting on one to two acre lots. Now, if we consider the average worker in Jackson County, their area median income is $40,000. A common affordability metric when considering purchasing a home is that the purchase price of the home does not exceed three times the person's annual income. We can quickly see that the average worker in Jackson County cannot afford the average single family home. And unfortunately, there aren't too many variety or options for these either. From this chart, we can see the mix as well as the number of new houses built in Jackson County over the previous decades. We see that the vast majority of homes built are single family home styles with very few high density homes built every year can barely see some of the slivers on the top of those charts. I'd also like to draw your attention to the reduction in new houses built over the previous decade, which has caused the median age of a single family home to balloon up to 51 years old. 
Now these older homes generally have outdated electricity, plumbing, insulation, roofs, and some other costs that can lead to higher monthly expenses for these older homes, as well as costing more to insure. This puts the average worker in a dilemma. Do they go for the newer home and try to sign up for a mortgage payment that they may not quite be able to afford? Or do they go with the older home, which will maybe have some of these surprise expenses pop up, as well as be expensive to insure? Neither is preferable. AERG believes that Jackson County must expand its supply of attainable workforce housing to address these issues. With, with careful attention paid to the characteristics of the housing units, the integration of the development into the current housing supply, as well as how the general population will perceive it, AERG can provide potential solutions and scenarios in which Jackson County can address this housing attainability issue. The question then becomes, how many units do we need to build? What do these units look like? And how much is this thing gonna cost? To dive into those questions, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Mike, who's gonna walk you guys through our methodology, as well as the impacts from the scenarios. Thank you, Will. Now that we've analyzed the two markets we will be affected in Jackson County, we can walk you through the methodology we use to determine how the economic impact will change due to different developments and what the total economic um, impact will be of these developments. So we first use the National Home Builders Association's guide to find construction costs per square feet for various units. This will tell us the total cost per one unit and varying lot sizes, home sizes, and the type of units we can determine how many lots we can fill in Endeavor Park. We use these two metrics to find the total construction cost, the total development, and this number will be used in our input-output model. Our input-output model software is InPlan. And InPlan uses multipliers based on the interconnectedness of over 500 industries to determine how a dollar spent on construction will ripple through the economy and generate revenue for local businesses, employment, and local, state, and federal taxes. However, our Input-output model can't tell us everything, and we still need to find the revenue generated from property tax revenue once these units are occupied. For that, we assumed a 15% profit margin on the total uh, cost for each unit and used the county's millage rate for our tax district to find the ad valorem property tax revenue. From the results of our input-output model, the ad valorem property tax revenue, we can find the total fiscal and economic impact of new construction in Endeavor Park. We then provided Jackson County with three scenarios of how they could utilize this land. Our first scenario is our baseline model. This is what would happen if Jackson County were to sell the land and relinquish control of the developmental process in a residential park. Uh, to estimate the price of this land that would sell for, we use property appraisal websites and public records to see how other land was selling in the area and we estimated that Jackson County can sell the 190 acres for $1.9 million. Now, if Jackson County does not retain the development plans for this land, we can model this development after the current housing market. We estimate that developers could place 140 new units with square footage sizes ranging from 12 to 1,800 square feet on one to two acre lots with an estimated sale price of 160 to $240,000. And here's the distribution of those houses that we estimated. We know that the current housing market in Jackson County is not attainable. And there seems to be a divide between private developers willing to provide attainable housing and the families in need who are desperate for this attainable housing. With the new buildings being constructed in Jackson County, particularly houses declining every year and construction costs rising, this divide only widens and providing attainable housing to those families in need seems more and more out of reach. However, we did provide a solution to this problem, and to mitigate this divide, we suggest Jackson County and private developers form a public-private partnership to ensure that attainable housing is brought to Endeavor Park. The terms of this agreement would be Jackson County transferring the land to private developers and using community development block grant funds to offset construction costs for these private developers. Private developers would own land and the new, the, the new units they construct ensuring that they see profits instead of Jackson County when the land is sold, or the homes are sold, I'm sorry. Now, Jackson County still benefits from this arrangement. They will see revenue from new activity and construction in the area, property taxes once these uh, units are occupied, and the revenue generated from the expanded uh, workforce that these new units uh, are available for. 
The first scenario that we utilize this mixed housing development is scenario two. These characteristics resemble the same community feel of Jackson County. However, we reduce lot size and square footage to ensure attainability without compromising on quality. We estimate that this development would see 430 new units spread out between single family homes, modular homes, and multifamily homes. Now modular homes are single family homes, however they are built in large sections off site, transported, transported to the site, developed and placed on permanent foundations. They are indistinguishable from single family homes once constructed. Residents in this community will feel right at home and it still leaves plenty of room for them to expand in the future. Our third scenario is a high density development that will also utilize the private public partnership. This scenario maximizes all available space and is still in line with Jackson County's code of ordinances that allow up for four single family units per acre and 16 multifamily units per acre. This new construction would see 710 developed units spread out between densely clustered single family homes and multifamily homes. This type of development is not usually common in Jackson County. However, it does provide the capability of producing the largest total economic impact due to the large number of houses, therefore the most available units for future workforce members and the current members of Jackson County. But high density development has its drawbacks. If members of the community are not accustomed to living to it, the vast reduction in lot size, home size, and the lack of future growth in these communities might deter people from purchasing these homes. Community considerations is a big deal in developing housing units and it must be taken into consideration. Now my colleague Will will report the illicit distribution of the houses that we see in this development. And now my colleague Will will run through the 12 year projection of total tax county revenue after each year for each development scenario. Thank you, Mike. Now that my colleague has watched you guys through our methodology and how we were able to uh, discern the economic and fiscal impacts of this development, I'm gonna walk you guys through some of the results. After summating both the uh, economic and fiscal impacts of actually building the attainable workforce development, as well as the effects from the expansion of the labor force, we ran a 12 year projection of the county tax revenue and found that the mixed use scenario was the one that produces the largest fiscal benefit. There is a nice jump up in year one as from selling the land, there is a boost in tax revenue which can then be put into an interest earning account for the future. However, the mixed use scenario and the high density scenario um, outpace that into the future. So for that reason, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the economic and fiscal impacts of the mixed housing scenario. As for the effects of simply building up the development, we predict that once again, 430 units costing roughly $64 million to build would result in 700 construction jobs directly as well as 167 jobs from indirect and induced effects of this economic, um, economic activity. The state of Florida can expect $1.7 million over the duration of this project, while the county itself can expect a little over a million dollars during this project. Now, let's move on to the economic and fiscal impacts of the expansion of the employment of the labor force as a result of the attainable workforce housing development. These 430 units would occupy roughly 550 new workers, as well as 250 indirect and induced workers as a result. This would be an expansion of $31 million in wage and salary income for the county, which would be extra money in the citizens' pockets being spent in the local community and economy, which would drive further economic development and growth for the community. The state of Florida can expect $2.7 million in additional tax revenue from, this, from the expansion of the labor force, while the county can expect almost $2 million in additional tax revenue. This figure down here does not include the $600,000 expansion of ad valorem revenue for the county, which when comparing that to ad valorem taxes in 2020 for the county represents about a 5.5% increase. As in 2020, ad valorem tax represented 28% of the county's revenue. This is a sizable increase that the county can use for future economic and um, economic development and growth projects in the future. Now that I've gone through these results a little bit more, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Abigail. Thank you, Will. 
One of the major questions in our analysis was how do each of our scenarios stack up in terms of the impact from housing construction and the resulting workforce expansion. We found that while the high density scenario yields the greatest impact from construction alone, it was our mixed housing scenario that took the lead in terms of the overall potential impact in the long run. This scenario follows closely behind the high density scenario in terms of the impact from housing development. And it is predicted to outpace both of the other scenarios in terms of the employment effects. As this scenario most closely aligns with Jackson County's current housing landscape, and we expect a greater rate of uptake from this scenario than the other two scenarios, resulting in more people moving into this county and thus greater employment effects. Now for all three of our scenarios, we found that the employment effects outweighed the impacts from development alone. This is because construction will yield fixed returns over the duration of the project, while the employment effects will continue to be seen for years to come as new workers move into the county and take residence in our development. Regardless of how the county chooses to proceed, each of our scenarios will provide them with economic growth, an influx of tax revenue, and an expansion of their labor force. Most importantly, we find that attainable workforce housing is the key to sustained economic development through industry expansion. Now we recognize that Jackson County is not the only area that is experiencing a shortage of housing to accommodate their workforce. And at we hope that this project may also act as a model for other rural communities throughout the state and country who wish to spur economic development and support their workforce. We'd like to thank you for your time today, and now we'd like to open up the floor for any questions you may have regarding our project. All right, so we'll take any questions y'all have. Go ahead. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the executive director for Opportunity Florida and uh, Career Source Chipola. So I'm, I've been over in that area for a long time. And, and first, I just want to say thank you for taking on the project. One of the things that we find in rural Florida is that people are, they, they shy away from a lot of projects in rural areas because the data is just a lot harder to get most of the time. So I really do appreciate that. I've been doing this about 20 years, and, and I think this is the first time I've seen anything that's told us that the expansion of the employment has the larger economic impact. And I just wanted to know from your side going in, is that something you expected to see? Is it something that you thought would happen or, or is it different than what you see in maybe an, an urban area if you were to look at that? This is as we would have predicted. And as I mentioned before, the construction impacts, the impacts from the housing development alone, this is going to yield primarily fixed returns. There, it's going to bring in construction employment as the project is being built, and we're going to see an influx of tax revenue in the short term that will eventually taper off. However, the, these employment effects that we described, those are the result of new people moving into the county. Um, they're taking up residence in our housing development, and they are going to contribute to the local economy by um, becoming employed in Jackson County. That was a major feature of our analysis was that we wanted to find ways to um, allow for industry expansion through the expansion of attainable housing and not only being employed in the county but spending their um, income in the county. So they'll be shopping at the local grocer, they'll be buying cars, they will be paying taxes in the county. So that I think is a major reason why we would see greater employment effects over the long term horizon. Very good. Uh, other questions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Many analysis done to say what the um, uh, impact would have to be uh, in terms of revenues generated by the different options to cover the um, comprehensive county planning impacts and the, the policing, the road development that would be necessary to kind of cover uh, the cost of the uh, housing project itself. Hi, uh, thank you for your question. Um, we did consider the municipalities would have to cover extension of like uh, fires and roads and clearing the land and all that. However, we could not find accurate data to describe how land clearing would work in Jackson County and what areas particularly are covered by wetlands. We do know that it's 190 acres, however, the exact acreage and parcels of land were undetermined and we could not find data on how to clear the land, provide utilities and all that such. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, that was an excellent presentation. I got a couple questions here. Um, first one is when thinking about the monthly rents of a, a rented property versus the monthly mortgage rate um, on a on a purchase property, how close were those two numbers? Did you have a model for like what where they needed to be in order to fill accordingly and not like all fill to the housing market and all fill to the the rental market for the purpose of what I, the question I'm asking is um, specifically. Was there, any, was there any concern about everybody buying houses or everybody renting as quickly as possible and then ha not having the other half of the project fill up? Any thought or consideration put into that? Thank you. Um, so yeah, the income uh, for the apartments will be uh, rent restricted to income limits based on your amount of AMI in the area, your area median income, and your total household size. And we did kind of model the same 70-30 split that we see in renters versus occupied units in Jackson County. Um, and these, housings, these housing options are very attainable to the community, and they fall within that region of 60 to 120% AMI. So we do see that the housing options are affordable to people in that area, as well as the rental units. So predicting how the inflow would be is up to Jackson County um, and the residents there, but we did maintain that same 70-30, 70% occupied uh, ownership, and then 30% renter-occupied ownership. You all may have mentioned this, so forgive me for asking, but are you, is your analysis assuming that all of the housing units will be occupied? And if so, how did you explore that question? Yes, so our um, output results did assume that all of the housing units were going to be occupied. These are our best case scenario estimates. And for this reason, that is why we chose to focus on the mixed housing scenario, because that is the scenario that cl most closely models what the county is already seeing in terms of its housing distribution and how the residents self-select into housing. And so we would not expect for the high density scenario to necessarily fill up at the same rate as the mixed housing scenario. So if, um, if all three of the scenarios saw max fill rates, then our high density scenario would take the lead. How, how would it change your analysis if you were to assume lower, lower rates of occupied housing in that development? Yeah, absolutely. We would have to consider how many units are, we do consider how many units are built each year over the duration of the project. We would also then have to do further analysis into how long the houses generally stay on the market in Jackson County, um, what sort of units move faster than other ones, and we would have to incorporate that into our um, into that uh, over the duration of the project sort of steps on how many units are available, how many units would be taken up each year, and that's how we would have to change our analysis to incorporate those sorts of figures. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more if anybody has another question. Did you, did you have any sort of breakdown, the folks who didn't work in the county and would presumably be commuting, do you have any sort of a breakdown of that and a sense of how that may or may not help your model in terms of uh, which housing solution works best? So if I understand your question correctly, you were asking how did we discern that the people that would be moving into the households are coming from outside of the county or inside of the county or? Right, so how would that have an impact on your results? Was there any way to measure that? We did not take that into account in this analysis, although we did consider that if someone relocated from inside of the county to this new development, then their old home would now come up onto the market and would also further increase the housing supply of Jackson County. So. While it would be a larger economic and fiscal impact to attract people from outside of the county, add them to the tax base, add new people paying property taxes and sales tax, while that would have a larger effect than people relocating from inside of the county to this new development, it would still have the effect of increasing the housing supply because 
those people would now leave that home and move into the new home. So. Thank you. Um, our next team is getting set up. Thank you guys. Thank you, Jackson County. Let's give them a round of applause. And our next group today is the cost and benefit analysis of Florida VPK expansion. Hi, I'm Lindsay Kirkland. I'm Julia Pratt. And I'm Duncan Mugford. Today we're gonna to be going over a cost and benefit analysis of Florida's voluntary pre-kindergarten program and a possible expansion of this program to include three-year-olds as it currently only serves four-year-olds. Now, one thing we wanna note here is that the VPK program in Florida is especially important due to the fact that any family in Florida that is potentially planning on having children is impacted by this program. And this is simply due to the fact that this program is universally eligible in nature. Now for some background on Florida's current VPK program. The program debuted in 2005, offering universal free preschooling to all four-year-olds in the state. The program provides 540 hours of childcare during the school year, or 300 hours of childcare during the summer. Florida's VPK program is unique in comparison to most states in that there are no eligibility requirements for enrollment, meaning there are no demographic groups or family income thresholds a child must be in in order to receive free preschool. The purpose of Florida's VPK program is to provide options for families when choosing childcare, increase readiness before students enter K through 12, and lay a foundation in reading and math for children. The goal of our analysis is to look at the state cost and benefits of expanding Florida's VPK program to three-year-olds. We'll look at the impacts and then at the end make a recommendation as to whether Florida should or should not expand the program. A multitude of studies have been conducted examining the impact of early education. These studies show that children who attend preschool display an increase in development compared to children who do not attend preschool. In Texas, children who, are in, who were enrolled in preschool had a higher preparedness for a classroom environment and also displayed better behavioral and socialization skills compared to other children. Studies also show that preschool leads to an increase in academic preparedness. Preschoolers in Boston achieved higher reading and math readiness rates compared to children who did not receive education before entering K through 12. And finally, research supports that offering free preschool to families increases labor force participation rates in parents as the flexibility and options for childcare and decreased financial burden faced by these families um, allows more of them to enter the workforce. In Washington, D.C., an expansion of the VPK program led to an increase of over 10% in the maternal labor force participation rate compared to before the expansion. Before we continue with the rest of our presentation, we'd like you to consider some different Florida families. The median household income in the state of Florida is $54,000. 12% of families in the state are below the poverty line. 38% of households are single parent families and only 47% of households have parents who are both active in the workforce. So before we dive into our methodology, we'd like you to consider these statistics. Moving into how we actually calculated some of the costs and benefits for this study, the first thing we wanna talk about is how we selected our data. We used a survey of income and program participation here, which is census-based household level data, and they had a data availability for both 2018 and 2020. And while we realize 2020 is more recent, due to the COVID-19 pandemic in 2019, that dropped both participation rates and costs for the VPK program for multiple years. However, we've seen that been trending back upwards, especially with 2021 data that VPK is starting to put out. So we decided to go 2018, as we think pre-COVID values will be a better representation moving forward for the state. So the first benefit that we wanted to calculate was family savings. And the first thing that we had to figure out for family savings is actually how many families will be impacted by this. First thing we did was we figured out what proportion of all households currently have a three-year-old in them. These will be all the households eligible for the VPK expansion. 
The next one you had to figure out was how many of these households currently pay for childcare. As these are the households that we are most confident will be engaging the VPK program as they currently engage in a substitution for it. And this is a conservative estimate, as if we put the VPK expansion into place, it's likely that more and more families that currently are eligible but don't pay for childcare will engage with the program as well. The next thing we wanted to look at was how many hours each family engages with the program. We here focused on the school year rather than the summer semester due to the fact that the VPK program in the school year experiences a much higher participation rate and this has been consistent over the years in comparison to the summer semester. The final thing we had to look at for family savings was the actual cost of childcare per hour. And to approximate this, we use the average hourly wage of a child care provider, as reported by Bureau of Labor Statistics. Next, we want to take a look at some qualitative impacts that we found in our study as well. As Julia already discussed, there's been benefits that have been shown from, oh, one behind, sorry. Benefits that have been shown from child development. First one of these is that child, children that have gone through the voluntary pre-kindergarten program in other states have all shown more academic success on early years than children who have not. Another factor here is that the children who go through these programs have less behavioral issues overall compared to children that do not go through these programs. Another thing we want to talk about here is that there will be an increase in labor force participation from these programs. SIPP data itself from the 1990 was actually able to determine an elasticity of, based on the child care reduction cost, how much the employment of both married and single mothers would increase. And while the variables that they use to calculus are no longer used in current SIPP, we're confident that even though the magnitude may be slightly different, the direction of this will still be the same, which is to say, due to the cost of childcare being reduced by VBK program being introduced, we know that labor force participation will go up among these communities. Next, we're gonna look at some of the costs. The first thing we wanted to calculate with the costs was administrative costs. And this is a little bit interesting as VPK currently reports all their administrative costs as one lump sum. They don't differentiate the difference between their administrative wages and their other administrative costs. So since we were trying to find administrative salaries here, we had to make an assumption that all administrative costs would scale proportionally with the amount of three-year-olds being added to the program. So then we simply divided the current amount of administrative costs by the current number of administrators to figure out how many administrative costs were being added with each new administrator. Next, we had to figure out the amount of needed personnel due to the expansion. Florida VPK self-reports a value of VPK administrators to children added. And with our other data gathered, we are able to estimate a number of predicted number of three-year-olds that are gonna be added with the expansion. We simply plug this into the ratio to figure out how many administrators will also be added. The next cost we wanted to look at was the direct cost to the state. The state pays VPK providers lump sums of money in order to initiate the VPK program in their facilities, assuming that they sign up for it. First, we had to figure out how many three-year-olds were actually in the state of Florida. This was easy to gather simply from census data, but the next thing was tricky. We had to figure out what percentage of these three-year-olds will actually participate in the program. This was complex due to the fact that Florida has never offered VPK to three-year-olds in the past. So instead, we looked at some other states' VPK programs. We looked at states that had similar four-year-old participation rates to Florida's own, and we compared their three-year-old participation rates with their four-year-old participation rates, and then we averaged out these comparisons to figure out an approximate three-year-old participation rate for Florida. Next, we simply had to use the direct cost currently for each four-year-old child in the program. This is about $2,200 and we're confident that this number should be about the same for three-year-olds as well, as this number has remained consistent over the years. And now, we'll move a little bit into the results section. Okay, so now for our findings. Before we get into them, it's important to note that the numbers here are the direct costs and benefits that we found. So they do not include some of the indirect uh, factors that we've talked about previously, like increased labor force participation rate for parents or improved child development for students. So first, looking at the state cost, we have $141 million in direct costs. Those will be paid from the state directly to the child care facilities that are offering care. Below that, we have $5 million in administrative costs. Those are gonna be all of the overhead expenses that are associated with the expansion. Moving on to benefits, 
we have $146 million in family benefits. So for these benefits, we took the estimated savings from families that currently have three-year-olds and are paying for their care. To find the benefits, we um, took what their savings would be if they were to enroll their three-year-old in VPK as opposed to paying for the care. When we took that throughout the entire state, we found 146 million. Now, as you may have noticed, these numbers are very similar to each other. In fact, there's only a difference of $450,000 between them, where the costs slightly outweigh the benefits. However, please keep this $450,000 number in mind, um, as it does get more interesting when we dig into the numbers a little deeper. So, first, we found the average state cost per child is $2,300. This means that for every additional child who is enrolled in Florida's VPK program, the state pays for $2,300 annually for them to uh, participate. Next, we found the average household savings is $4,300. So for every family um, who has a three-year-old and chooses to enroll them in the VPK program, they'll save about $4,300 in childcare annually. Now the difference between these is about $2,000. So for every additional three-year-old who is enrolled in Florida's VPK program, there will be a net benefit of $2,000. So now, keeping in mind the $450,000 from the previous slide and the $2,000 benefit per child um, enrolled, we found that an addition of only 225 three-year-olds past our estimated enrollment number would actually have the benefits outweigh the costs. To put this into perspective, that's only 0.15% of the three-year-old population of Florida that would have to enroll past our estimated enrollment number. It's also important to contextualize what the cost of the expansion actually means to the state of Florida. As we found, the cost will be about $146 million. In 2021, Florida's total state budget was $101 billion. In 2022, their total state budget was just over $105 billion. So if we have our expansion at around $100 million and Florida's state budget at around $100 billion, our expansion is only 0.1% of Florida's total uh, budget every year. Now, with these numbers in mind, we're going to revisit the Florida families um, that we asked you to keep in mind at the beginning of our presentation. Jumping back to the median income family, we see that $54,000 is the medium household income. Out of this, $4,000 would be the savings they experience from VPK. This is 7% of that household's total income. This is a significant amount of financial stress and burdens that could be taken off of this household. Moving on though, it's more interesting when we look at the 12% of families below the poverty line. Here, we use the basis of a household of four where the federal poverty line is about $25,000. $4,000 would be about 15% of savings of that household's income here. And keep in mind that this could also go to a household of three or even a household of two where there's a single parent and a child. The savings for those families would be even greater than 15%. But here, the 15% shows us that not only will these families be saving a lot of money so now they can rest easier without so many financial burdens, but some of these families with such a significant amount of savings might actually be able to afford childcare now where they couldn't beforehand. So as mentioned earlier, 38% of households in the state of Florida are single parent families. With the addition of, an, for an, with an addition of one free year VPK, these single parent families will be facing a decrease in financial burden and will have a lot more flexibility in the childcare that um, is an option for them. And as we said earlier, only 47% of families in the state of Florida have both spouses employed in the home, meaning that with an extra free year of VPK, these parents will have flexibility in choosing whether, whether to re-enter the workforce, and we should see this number increase overall. With this information, we can now look at the two options that Florida has for expanding their VPK program. Their first option is to not expand keep the program as it is that just serves four-year-olds. 
And while this would be the cheaper option, Florida also wouldn't see the benefits of the expansion. The second option, which is the one that we're recommending today, is for Florida to expand its VPK program to include three-year-olds. This expansion has the potential to benefit hundreds of thousands of families in Florida, increase labor force participation rates for parents, improve child development outcomes, and provide a safe learning environment for children. We now look forward to answering your questions. Very good. I'm happy to take any questions. Kyle. Hey guys, good work. Um, you guys talked about it a little bit in the beginning that labor force participation rates could increase. Was there any consideration to look into what those unrealized wages could be and how that could benefit families and put a tangible number to it? Yes, yeah, so um, like we said earlier as well, older studies have actually been able to put like a concrete number on this. However, the data that they used is still there, but the SIPP doesn't actually report all these variables anymore. And as Julia pointed out, in Washington, D.C., they've been able to put concrete numbers on it as well. Our VPK program isn't an exact match for Washington's, so we couldn't say what the exact uh, labor force participation increase would be. However, because it mimics both the older SIPP data and the Washington study, where we just know that the increase would be there. Go ahead. So if I, if I miss this, I apologize. Did you give any thought to like multiple child households? So if a P VPK uh, three K three year old was coming back to school or coming to school, also their fifth and f five and one year old siblings are coming to daycare as well. And and just a little bit deeper than that, if you have three kids at home with a nanny, you know that that's one or uh, someone taking care of them. That's one cost. Um, sending them to daycare. Um, even if it's a VPK program, you have those additional costs for the siblings. So I was just wondering if that factored into your... Um yeah, thank you. So we looked at um, some households that would have multiple children. Um, in particular, we were looking into uh, family savings with maybe twins or triplets, multiples that would be in VPK at the same time. Um, since they were such a small percentage of the population in Florida, we decided not to include them and just focus on um, the single child that would be in VPK. Um, and in regards to children multiple ages being in the household, those families would still be experiencing savings, especially if some of those children are four-year-olds. And as children get older, parents generally have been shown to engage in the child care less and less. So the savings are most important for the younger ages as well. Um, besides labor force participation, was there anything else for like non-families benefit-wise you thought about, like people without kids in Florida? Or was labor force the, the biggest thing? Um, so labor force, labor force was the largest issue that we looked at, but in terms of benefits for families who don't have children um, or people who don't have children in the state, um, they would still be benefiting from this expansion due to the increase in labor that would be provided by parents um, and also just the benefits that would be reaped later on by children who did attend preschool and had a better academic preparedness. Um, so overall, the whole state would be benefiting because this is the future of the state that would be um, impacted. Um, along with labor force participation rate, we also, when that increases, there's also uh, an increased tax revenue to the state. So um, while we've seen that in some of the other studies that we looked at, like the DC study, um, we again chose not to quantify it for our cost benefit analysis just because it would have been um, because of the situation in Florida, it would have been harder to quantify. Um, did you find in your other states analysis whether there was any uh, efficiencies in cost per child in going, essentially doubling the number of uh, children that were added? And then secondly, did you look at all at uh, the capacity of the existing facilities, either physically or with labor and administrators to be able to actually 
do this? So interestingly enough, Florida doesn't actually meet current legal benchmarks for making sure they cap the size of classrooms. Um, so this was not a huge consideration for us because the state doesn't currently actually put a lot of resources into following that restriction. It's up to the providers, and the providers can structure their classrooms how they wish after they have the VBK money, as long as they're issuing that program to the children. Great question. Um, any, okay, awesome. Um, I know that your analysis looked at the dip in data availability during COVID, but did you all consider the increase in birth rates that was expected after that and or the general decline in birth rates in the last 20 years, just how few people are having children earlier and whatnot. Did that factor in at all? Um, so one of the things with COVID-19 is there's been conflicts on either side about birth rate there, but overall, with the, due to the fact that birth rate has been changing every year in the past and that Florida VBK's numbers have been consistent like over a decade or so, we're confident that they should pretty much remain on a consistent level there, even though birth rate's been changing for the last 10 years or so too. Um, I'm interested in what you guys examined about the effects on academic preparedness. And I think you mentioned a Boston study about children who attended pre-K versus children who didn't. Um, and I was just wondering if you looked into that study and know what other factors they like examined that maybe conflicted with that metric. Um, so as we mentioned before, Florida's VPK program is pretty unique in that there are no eligibility requirements. So a lot of the studies that we looked at, including the Boston study, most of these students are in certain demographic groups or low, from lower income families. Um, so that definitely could um, differentiate from Florida, but we are pretty confident that um, the developmental increases that w were studied um, would match Florida as it's just more children. Um, and the increase in classroom preparedness does have a positive effect on them uh, throughout K through 12. Other questions? Oh boy. Uh, sorry, don't mean to be a frequent flyer in this endeavor. Uh, <laughs> just a quick question. When you reviewed other states, was, was it always the case that it was a binary choice? Either you had no subsidy for VPK3 or 100% uh, subsidy. Was there, were there any states that were sort of in the middle that said, we're going to give a partial subsidy for this group? Every state's VP program differs a little bit. So there are some states that do things similar to that, and there's some states that just go directions of wanting to subsidize it even more. This is why we looked at multiple states when we were making our average participation rate, because we knew that no other state's program matches perfectly to Florida's own. So we were trying to match things based on how similar the participation numbers were overall. All right, I think we have time for one more question, if anybody has a question for the current group. All right, we'll let the next group go ahead. This is our group um, studying the Florida Medicaid expansion. Good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Brown, and I'm joined by my two teammates, Mike Rivera and Jonathan Haywood. We want to thank you all for taking the time to be here today. Now, our topic of research is on, Medi is on Florida Medicaid. Uh, more specifically, we're here to present a cost-benefit analysis of Medicaid eligibility expansions under ACA regulations. Now, we know that not everyone's aware of what the ACA and Medicaid entail or how it's applied to Florida's population, so let's dive in. 
Now, Florida adopted its Medicaid program in 1970 and currently offers a total of 43 services and benefits, even those less common, such as acupuncture and nutrition. Medicaid spending accounted for a total of 31.76% of Florida State's total budget. Medicaid's purpose is to provide health insurance coverage to those low-income, most vulnerable demographics. The current criteria for eligibility being those who are pregnant, disabled, elderly, or with dependents, as well as annual income below federal poverty line thresholds. As you can see by the map depicted above, this is the monthly Medicaid enrollment by percentage of population as of 2020. Our target demographics are going to be more concentrated in southern Florida and in the central counties uh, compared to the others. And as of this same year, Medicaid covered 3.7 million Floridians. Now, here we provide a timeline of events. After the signing of Medicaid into law in 1965 and its adoption in Florida in 1970, rising health care spending led then-Governor Jeb Bush to propose a reform to Florida's Medicaid beginning in 2004, initially in only two counties, Duval and Broward. Then in 2010, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was signed into law by then-President Barack Obama. Now, the ACA provided for some notable controversy that we'll be, we'll be getting into on our next slide. However, by 2014, Jeb Bush's proposal had been implemented all across Florida. This reform effectively reduced costs and improved system delivery. However, it did not extend eligibility to any new parties. And at present, Florida has yet to opt for any kind of eligibility expansions under the ACA. Now, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act had three major components. Firstly, it came with the individual mandate requiring all applicable citizens to maintain basic health insurance coverage or face a monetary, pe monetary penalty. Secondly, it created the ACA exchange or the health insurance marketplace where qualified private health insurance plans can be purchased. And thirdly, it extended Medicaid eligibility to include low-income young adults, as well as increase FPL thresholds by five percentage points. Prior to 2010, income limits were set at up to 138% of the FPL. Now they stand at up to, prior to 2010, excuse me, they were set at up to 133%. Now they stand at up to 138% of the FPL. 138% translated to an annual income of 17,000 for an individual and 36,000 for a family of four. Now, some stipulations of the ACA were contested in a Supreme Court case known as the National Federation of Independent Business versus Sibelius. The, medi the expansion mandate, the Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional. The solution to this was to leave it intact in the ACA, but they did resort to restricting the Secretary's enforcement power, and so they disallowed the withholding of funds from any state for the noncompliance of expansion. This act effectively placed the choice to expand in the hands of the state. Now, should Florida opt for Medicaid eligibility expansions under the ACA, a new demographic would become eligible to enroll. Those non-pregnant, without dependents, low-income adults between the ages of 19 to 64, uh, and able-bodied would become eligible for Florida, Florida Medicaid. The question that we aim to address with our research is what are the net benefits of expanding Medicaid to this newly eligible demographic weighed against the cost of implementation? As we stated earlier, our approach to this subject is going to be a cost-benefit analysis, but more specifically, a net-benefit be formula. We, we believe that to provide a fuller picture at the scope of our task, this chart may be of use. Step one, we're going to start from our research subject and identify the criteria for our new eligible demographic. Step two, we're going to quantify the direct impacts, which is, which is the cost of implementation. We'll do this by multiplying our newly enrolled by the cost to state per enrollee to get the total cost of implementation. This will be uh, a very generous estimation of cost in which we see a 100% take up rate. Step three, we're going to quantify and identify the indirect impacts of expansion. These are, going to be the co these are going to be the positive effects associated with Medicaid expansion seen by current literature, as well as seen in states that have opted for Medicaid eligibility expansions. And from this, we'll get the total net benefits. To get deeper into the numbers, I'll be handing it off to my teammate, Mike. Thank you, Caitlin. Now we're gonna look into the benefits to the state and society. Um, after the expansion of Medicaid under ACA, 
some of the recent literatures have noticed five main benefits, which include education, employment, crime, mortality, as well as bankruptcy. We're gonna dive into education first. Um, one of the recent literatures has seen a reduction in percentage point to the dropout rate, which is 0 0.658. Um, the average dropout rate in Florida is 3.8%, and that reduction is equivalent to 5,600 dropouts in Florida. And then we're gonna see another literature that brings in the dropout cost to the state, approximately being $278,000. And that's due to a lessening of tax contributions throughout someone's lifetime. And then we're going to look at the state benefit, which is equivalent to $24.33 million. And the societal benefit, which is going to be equivalent to $1.56 billion, which we arrive at this amount by the reduction in dropouts times the dropout cost for the societal benefit. Now looking to um, employment, we see a two, in one of the recent literatures, we see a 2.1% increase in part-time jobs, which is equivalent to 3,000 jobs. <clears throat> and then we're also seeing an increase in uh, behaviors. One is a uh, job lock, where individuals will decide to stay in their position to continue to have their employee benefits, as well as job switching, where people have recently switched their jobs in the past few months. And arriving at we're navigating through our calculations, we looked at not only the 3,000 part-time jobs, but the mean wage of our eligible group who also worked part-time jobs times the effective tax rate in Florida, which is approximately 8.23%. And then we also saw a reduction in full-time employment, which was around 2%, but after a year, it did come back to pre-expansion levels. Our state benefit, using the 3,000 and then times the 9,000, the 3,000 part-time jobs and the 9,000 of the mean wage times the effective tax rate, we arrived at $2.2 million. And then for societal benefit, all we have to do is not multiply by the effective tax rate, getting $26.7 million. And then now we're diving into bankruptcy. One of the recent literatures saw a reduction of 4% after a Medicaid expansion under ACA, which was equivalent to 1,022 um, fewer bankruptcies. And the average medical bankruptcy cost was $6,601, which we saw a state benefit of $6.6 .6 million. And it was undefined how to calculate the societal benefit. So um, throughout our calculations, we decided to continue the societal benefit as $6.6 .6 million. Now we're going to be looking at a literature, a recent literature in crime, Vogler which noticed a 3.3% reduction in overall crime after um, Medicaid expansion under ACA. And then looking at, at the FBI's uniform crime report, reports, we saw 457,000 crimes committed in Florida in 2020. And then the state benefit was approximately $82 million and the societal benefit was approximately $687.9 million. And now diving into mortality, mortality rate. One of the recent literatures saw a 12, a reduction of 12 out of 100,000. And this is best expressed by uh, Medicaid expansion was associated with 12 fewer deaths per 100,000 US adults annually. And for Florida, that was um, uh, equivalent to 144 fewer deaths. What we did was is that mortality rate reduction times our eligible group of 1.2 million. And then we arrived at a state benefit of $161,256. This is due to tax contributions annually for our eligible group. And then our societal benefit, which was calculated with the average value of life from most recent studies, which was $951.4 million. And then coming back all together, we're seeing a total state benefit of $115.3 million and then a uh, total societal benefit of $3.23 billion, which will, we see that the societal benefit definitely outweighs the state benefit by quite a lot. And then I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague, John, who's gonna touch on the cost estimate. Now that we've established the benefits of expanding Medicaid in Florida, we will now touch on the cost to find the net effect. Finding out how much it would cost the state to expand Medicaid will provide policymakers key insight when deciding whether or not to take action on this. Our cost estimate will be for the time in which after federal subsidies are phased out as ruled by the ACA. 
To find the cost estimate, we first needed to find the number of newly eligible people, which would then be multiplied by the per capita state expenditure. To do this, we used data from the American Community Survey. Our data set include, included Floridians aged 19 to 64 years old. From this, we used th the, the following three variables to identify our expansion group. Income, household size, and Medicaid enrollment status. Our first two variables, income and household size, helped us identify those within the data set who, met the who meet the eligible e the FPL uh, limits outlined earlier. Uh, this, however, would overestimate our expansion group since it includes those who currently meet one or more of the categorical requirements for Medicaid eligibility in Florida. So we use our third variable, Medicaid enrollment status, to uh, identify and remove them from our expansion group. From this, we found an expansion group of 1.2 million people. The histogram here displays the incomes of these individuals relative to the rest of Florida. Now that we have this number, we must now multiply it by the uh, per capita state expenditure for Florida to find our total cost. The government agency which overviews Medicaid, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, computed estimates of this cost for all states in 2019. They divided uh, exp uh, state expenditure data by state a number of enrollees in the state and found in 2019 the cost estimate was uh, $2,754. Following their methodology, we used enrollment data from the Florida Agency of Healthcare Administration and uh, Florida expenditure data from the Kaiser Family Foundation. By dividing uh, the expenditures by number of enrollees, we found a cost estimate, a uh, cost per enrollee of three thousand and six dollars. Multiplying this by our one point two million, we find a total cost to the state of three point six billion. Note that this is the situation in which all newly uh, eligible people enroll. Subtracting this cost from our uh, benefits from earlier, we find a net effect to the state of three of a three point five billion dollar loss. As for state and society, when we use the low end of our benefits. We, we find a $210 million loss. However, when we use the high end of our benefits, we uh, estimate a $4.3 billion gain. Thank you for listening to our presentation. We look forward to your questions. Questions for our Medicaid group. Hey, I was just curious if you could elaborate on how you went from the, the 53 uh, million number to the 3.12 billion. Can you elaborate on that question a little bit more? Um, yes, so the, um, when you're estimating the, the full benefit at the bottom, you list between 3 billion and 6 billion. I'm just curious how that was, was calculated compared to the original 53 million. Okay, yes. So. The biggest change is the valuation of life, where uh, the average between the, the, the recent studies was 6.6 .6 million, but most recent numbers is approximately 10 to 11 million dollars per life. And that was a a definitely a significant jump from our 3 billion to our 7.8 billion. Other questions for our Medicaid group? Yeah, Carla. Thank you. Hey, um, great job, by the way, great presentation. Um, hello, okay. Um, so my question kind of had to do a little bit with the map that you showed. Um, in the beginning of, of Florida and kind of where Medicaid ut utilization is concentrated in, which seemed to me a little bit more kind of balanced between like some like bigger cities and then also like rural areas. For the rural areas, was it accounted for the cost of transportation to Medicaid utilization? It, does that does that make sense? Uh, so transportation costs, are you, are you referring to like people getting transferred to medical facilities? Correct. That is factored into the cost estimate. Okay. Uh, when following the methodology from 
the Medicare Center, Medicare and Medicaid Services Center, that, that they included that in their calculation, so we did as well. Thank you. Okay, we will take a brief break. Uh, we will reconvene, um, I think the program says 3.30, is that right? 3.30, okay, so y'all grab um, something to eat and drink, talk to our students, um, let me know if you have any questions and we'll see you back in a little bit.
All right, if you all could come back in and take your seats. We've got three more presentations. Thank you guys so much. And just as an aside, um, y'all are welcome to like uh, vote and give comments in between presentations and throughout the presentations as well. Um, you can wait to the end if you want to. Again, uh, for people that have joined us, uh, welcome to the Summer Symposium in Applied Economics. Uh, we just ask that if you are going to be a judge, um, you attend all the presentations. Uh, the next group up is Net Metering Policy Alternatives in Florida. Thank you guys so much. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Cannon, and I'm joined by my colleagues Owen Ragsdale and Robert Poole. Um, and today we'll be taking a look at an economic analysis of Florida's solar net metering program. So for those who are unfamiliar with what net metering is, it's essentially a policy in Florida that allows customers with renewable generation systems to receive credits from their utility companies from energy that they provide back to the grid. So Florida's um, net metering program has been around since 2008, um, and since then uh, we've seen an increase in solar adoption uh, as a result of the program. Uh, and this brings us to the context surrounding Florida's net metering program, which is House Bill 741. Uh, this is recent legislation that was passed through the Florida House and Senate, but was subsequently vetoed by Florida's governor. Uh, essentially what this program would have done would be to restructure the net metering program and alter the rates that are provided to customers. So in order to understand So in order to understand Florida's current net metering program, we first want to look at Florida's current solar landscape. So uh, as far as like the current policy, uh, Floridians are entitled to receive a full retail rate credit for each kilowatt hour that they provide back to the grid. And this is generally seen as a pretty favorable net metering policy. So again, Florida's net metering policy has been around since 2008. And since then, we've seen an increase in solar adoption. So based on data available to us from the Florida Public Service Commission, um, since the program's inception in 2008, uh, we've seen an increase in interconnection agreements. And all interconnection agreements are, are just contracts between net metering customers and their utility company. And for the purposes of our analysis, we use this to measure program participation over time. So um, rooftop solar has become increasingly more feasible for residents um, in the past five years. And as a result, we've seen an increase in program participation. This drops off briefly in 2020 due to factors surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic, but we even see this trend recover uh, up into 2021. Uh, in addition to resident investment in solar in Florida, we also see mirrored utility investment. So utilities have invested billions of dollars into uh, renewable generation systems uh, in order to provide clean energy to their customers. And this is mostly uh, taken up in form of large scale solar farms. Which brings us to some details surrounding Florida's House Bill 741. Uh, essentially, this would have restructured the net metering program in that it would alter the rates that it are provided to customers from the retail rate um, to a gradual decrease kind of step down until 2028 when the, retail, when the rate that is provided to net metering customers would be 50% of the retail rate or lower. Uh, so proponents of this legislation argue that the retail rate might be too high of compensation for net metering customers uh, as they're only responsible for generation, whereas utility companies incur costs that are related to things like transmission and distribution. Uh, opponents of this legislation, however, argue that the net metering program is a significant incentive for the adoption of rooftop solar, and therefore um, we should keep uh, maintain a retail rate credit uh, in order to incentivize the adoption of solar. Uh, and while this policy was vetoed, we do expect to see the conversation surrounding net metering to continue into the future. Thank you, Sean. So our project seeks to examine two key objectives. The first one being the maximization of solar capacity. How quickly and how efficiently can we incentivize solar throughout the state of Florida? And secondly, ensuring cost effectiveness for the state, utility companies, as well as consumers. And we analyze these two key objectives across two different scenarios. The first one being the continuation of the current net metering policy. 
where excess energy that is generated can then be transferred back to the grid for a full retail rate credit. Or alternatively, a revised rate policy, where excess energy that was credited back at the full retail rate will now decrease to 50% of the retail rate gradually over a period of four years. So um, in scenario one, which was our first scenario, uh, we wanted to envision the future of net metering should the current retail rate policy persist and individuals still be compensated that rate. Um, so utilizing the same data available from the Florida Public Service Commission on interconnection agreements, uh, we see that we still have the trend over the last five years, um, but we would like to forecast from 2020 using an ARIMA model um, to kind of see the increase in program participation over time. And what this tells us is that we do expect that if favorable incentives for net metering customers continue in this retail rate credit, we would expect program participation to continue to increase into the future. Um, and with rising fuel costs and advancements in solar technology, uh, we would expect this to be the case. Thank you, Sean. But before we get into kind of a revised retail rate credit, it's important to understand the components of the retail rate. And so starting with generation. Uh, generation roughly uh, is roughly 32% of the entire retail rate, followed by another 8% in transmission, another 24% in distribution, another 15% in depreciation and tax, and another 22% other costs. And you're probably wondering what's another cost. Other costs is usually uh, recovery co reco cost recovery clauses. And these are agreements between the state and these utility companies uh, that require them to invest in things such as uh, environmental uh, factors, um, storm protection, and fuel purchase agreements. But since they're required to invest in these areas, they also are entitled to recuperate um, that, that investment. And so all of this adds up to what it was the retail rate in 2020 of 10.06 uh, cents per kilowatt hour. And this at heart is the issue uh, or the argument that proponents of House Bill 741 argue is that while this retail rate is 10.06 cents per kilowatt hour, um, net metering customers are only really providing 3.2 cents per kilowatt hour and that the retail rate represents a vertically integrated company. Um, and so with that, Robert is going to lead us into our kind of case study. Thank you. So in order for us to examine the effects of something like Florida's House Bill 741 on the solar industry, we searched the nation with the intent of finding a comparable bill. And what we found is that Nevada has Assembly Bill 405, which is very similar to Florida's House Bill 741. And I just want to go into a brief historical background of net metering in Nevada. That way we can understand why that bill was imposed in the first place. So net metering in Nevada began in 1997, and we see a slow but steady increase of new interconnection agreements all the way up until 2015. In 2015, non-net metering customers were paying an additional $550 per year to compensate for net metering customers. And the Nevada Public Service Commission deemed this unfair, so they signed a bill into law that significantly reduced the incentives for net metering customers. That's why during this period of 2015 to 2017, we see a distinct stagnation in growth of new interconnection agreements. However, also during this time period, there were so many lawsuits over this that the Nevada Public Service Commission was forced to compromise. And that's when they signed in, in 2017, Assembly Bill 405, the bill that is nearly identical to Florida's House Bill 741. And with that in place, we once again see the restoration and growth of new interconnection agreements. So in order to um, use the, utilize this case study of this very similar policy that we see in Nevada, we wanted to model the effect of what a revised rate might look like in Florida. Uh, and to do this, we use data available from the U.S. Energy Information Administration um, in, as far as total program participants for both uh, Florida's net metering program as well as Nevada's net metering program. So the blue line illustrates what would happen uh, potentially if a current retail rate were to continue in Florida. And this is based on the average growth rate for the Florida's program for the past seven years. Um, and we just kind of projected this out to 2027. Uh, and the orange line here indicates what a revised rate might look like. And to do this, we use the average growth for Nevada's program uh, during the time when their similar bill was in effect and impose this over the time uh, when Florida's bill would have been into effect, which would have been from 2024 to 2027. And what we found was that based on these growth rates, there could be as many as 500,000 fewer participants in the net metering program 
as a result of reducing this financial incentive to consumers. So pivoting away from uh, kind of the residential side to more of the utility side, the figure here shows kind of three different categories of cost effectiveness based on system. And so in this top category, we have uh, the average residential system. Um, this data was provided by the, uh, from EIA as well, the Energy uh, Information Administration. And what we found was that the average resident, uh, residential system is about $2.58 per watt. And these systems any vary from anywhere from $18,000 to $11,000. And they have a capacity of anywhere from three to seven kilowatt hours, or kilowatts. Um, in this kind of second category, we have the local municipality here in Tallahassee. Um, this is the Tallahassee solar farm near the airport. Um, and there's a $33 million project that has around 264,000 solar panels and a 20 megawatt capacity. This breaks down to about $1.66 per watt. And then the large scale example we have is Duke Energy's current project where they are building a 10 site um, solar farm that includes 1,500 megawatts of capacity and uh, was about $2 billion and includes 5 million solar panels. This breaks out to about $1.33 per watt. Um, ultimately, this kind of speaks to what we refer to as economies of scale. Um, and, and kind of normal words, it's just buying in bulk. Uh, the ability for these large scale utilities to invest heavy amounts of, uh, of capital into uh, solar, they're able to kind of buy down the, buy down the price pr uh, per unit as, as, they, uh, as they do so. And so relating this back to the residential side, because of the economic feasibility that Sean mentioned earlier, we were curious to see what utility companies were doing uh, from the same time frame that we saw large uh, investments in rooftop solar. And the story is very similar. Uh, the graph right here to the right is uh, the uh, aggregate of the top four, top four Florida utilities. So this is Florida Power and Light, Duke, Tico, and uh, Gulf Power. And this is their uh, aggregate uh, capacity in megawatts in uh, solar energy in the state. And so what you see is from 2016, roughly 400 uh, megawatts in capacity. And in 2020, just under 4,000. I believe the number is exactly 2,912. And so this is exactly uh, kind of the same storyline we see in the residential side. And so with that, I'll pass it back to Robert. Great. So just to recap, we've analyzed two different objectives across two different scenarios. And under the first scenario, the continuation of the current net metering policy with the greatest amount of incentives to consumers, our findings indicate that this would be the best way to maximize rooftop solar capacity. And all we really see here with the maps is that there has been a substantial growth of new interconnection agreements from tw 2008 to 2020. Um, and that really just alludes to the fact that the bill has achieved its intended effect of maximizing rooftop solar. And conversely, we take this kind of same approach to the utility side as well. Um, something to note in, uh, in this is that in the, in the previous residential side, the, the total capacity in 2020 of net metering customers was roughly 490 megawatts. However, if you look at 2020, uh, the, the utility side has roughly 3,912 megawatts. Um, so as you can see, this is, again, speaks to the cost effectiveness and kind of economies of scale aspect of the, the, the advantage the utilities have. Um, and so with that, we want to kind of conclude with our findings. And so an overview, the current policy, as Robert uh, stated, was that maximizing rooftop solar has been the priority of the net metering program here in Florida. And we absolutely have seen that. Um, and we expect to continue to see steady growth in the net metering program as long as the retail rate is, uh, is continued. Um, when you reduce the financial incentive, we would expect to see a roughly $500,000 uh, 500, customer difference um, by the year 2027. Uh, conversely, in the utility production side, Due to the cost effectiveness and economies of scale, we find that utilities are investing heavily in, uh, in renewables, specifically solar here in the state. And this is in kind of in tandem with the residential side as well. Um, and kind of taking the 30,000 foot approach, the macro view of why this whole thing is important is, um, you know, as, for, as we all know, Florida's kind of environment and tourism is at the center of its economy. And this is, this is one of Florida's major pushes for um, sustainability um, and kind of moving forward with renewable energy. And so uh, with that, thank you for your time, and we appreciate you coming out. So we'll now open up to questions. Thank you, Net Metering Group. Questions? Dr. McClellan. Did you have any uh, sense that if the legislation passed and net metering declined, would industry step in and fill that void? Did you have any uh, evidence or references for that? 
Yeah, so one of the things that we did look at was we looked at what happened to Nevada utilities when uh, this with Assembly Bill 405 was imposed. And it's kind of ambiguous to, to know whether the money that utilities would save would actually go back into renewables specifically, but we did see that there was an increase in investment during that time as well. So um, I think it's kind of one of those things utilities, because of the economic feasibility, are heavily investing in renewables regardless if net metering is around. Um, so we expect that to continue. Did you consider the cost of financing for um, residential and utilities as they uh, construct these solar farms and rooftop solar? Um, yeah, so uh, in order to make the preliminary calculations for cost effectiveness for utilities, we uh, mostly, mostly looked at the overall cost of the project um, over the time that it would be uh, constructed and then divided by that, the megawatt capacity um, to get kind of an overall cost effectiveness metric that we could compare utility uh, investments to uh, residential investments. Uh, as far as financing for residential, we didn't consider that as a factor really in our analysis, but we do know that leasing programs are becoming more popular for uh, net metering customers um, as proposed by utilities. First of all, that y'all did an excellent job on that um, that data collection. Congratulations. So, the projected five hundred thousand fewer, um, right? So that number. Have, did you look at what the economics were and the economic impact is on that of that number versus um, the customers of the utilities who are paying the additional costs associated with that six dollars and thirty cents of of additional costs up and above generation. You follow what I'm, what I'm asking? Yeah. How do those two compare? Is it pretty close to even and out, or is it, uh, you follow me? Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 think, I think I understand your question. Okay. So uh, we don't have a direct comparison between the amount of uh, you know economic activity that would be generated by losing you know, 500,000 net metering customers, but we did consider the fact that you know, generation, transmission, and distribution, or what would be referred to as the avoided cost rate, um, might make up you know a significant portion of net metering customers. But we didn't want to speculate really um, how those costs would affect. Um, or how those savings would be reinvested. So that's not really um, something that we have a direct comparison between, but we do anticipate that uh, an impact of 500,000 fewer net metering customers would be um, kind of you know, impactful to consumers at least. All right, I thought Tony might have a question for us. So I think, Bill, thank you so much and great presentation. Um, lots of social benefits, but one of the arguments that was made during the last legislative session was the externality that you're transferring that other costs portion to the rest of the utilities payer. So while the consumer who is benefiting from net metering benefits, everybody else has pays for the externality. Has that been considered into this? Yeah, so I think that one of the first things that we looked at was kind of how much the, uh, there's there's really the, the four, um, I believe it's FPNL and Duke cover about 80% of net metering customers in the state. And so what we looked at was how much uh, the value of the energy they were crediting back was. And so I think for Duke, exam for example, it was around $34 million that they were crediting back in total. And so when we met with the Florida Public Service Commission, we, we kind of learned how the rate setting process worked and how um, basically you could, kind of petition over certain periods of time on whether to raise or lower rates based on variable costs. And so I think kind of we made the assumption that if costs were to come down, that there, they, the utility companies would have the ability to petition to lower the rate process, but it wasn't necessarily uh, like a necessity. It wasn't going to have to happen. I mean, it was really going to be up to them and what the Florida Public Service Commission decided. So we, again, we didn't want to speculate on like what a company would make decisions on that's kind of subjective.
Any other questions for our net metering group? All right, well done. Our next group is going to uh, explore the economic impact of adding people with disabilities to the labor force. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for all being here today. My name is Kieran Stewart Phillips. My name is Carlos Bello. And I'm Sheridan Meek. And today we're going to be presenting to you our work in association with the ABLE Trust in our analysis of adding people with disabilities to the labor force for the state of Florida. Sorry about that. No working. Okay. Oh, working. Oh, sure. Why is adding people with disabilities to the labor force so important? Sorry for that. So why is adding people with disabilities to the labor force so important? Well, to start, the labor force participation rate is the percentage of the population ages 16 and older who are either employed or unemployed and actively seeking work. In Florida's general population, this is 59.6%. However, 2.7 million Floridians report having disabilities. This is a substantial part of the population, nearly 15%. Yet of that population, only 22.8% are actively in the labor force. This is a gap of nearly 40 percentage points. And this 40 percentage point gap between the labor force participation rate for people with disabilities and the labor force participation rate for the general population is nothing new. It's been consistent for many years. For, the <coughs> for this analysis, we have partnered with the Able Trust, which is an organization it works for the betterment of employment opportunities of people with disabilities for the state of Florida. Since, it, it's, since its inception in the 1990s, the ABLE Trust has founded many programs that help towards this cause, some of which are grant programs that help fund businesses and organizations that seem to be key leaders in this um, cause, and uh, so many vocational and rehabilitational programs that um, you know, help people with disabilities of all ages. One of the programs that we want to highlight is the Florida High School High Tech, which is a program that focuses its attention on high school students with a variety of disabilities, not only learning about the opportunities that they have after high school, be it at a job or a post-secondary education, but also gives them the skills to be And yes, and um, this program ha has been quite successful because it has shown to have a 99% a um, a particip um, high school graduation rate and higher than average post-secondary allocation in either the, le the labor market or the post-secondary education. In working with the ABLE Trust, they have established an overall goal of decreasing this labor force participation rate gap from the general population and that of people with disabilities by one percentage point per year for 10 years. Our task in line with this is to then analyze the economic impact of decreasing this gap. However, 
Before we can properly tackle this question effectively, there's two major questions that we arose when we were doing our analysis. The first of which being, how exact, exactly how many people are going to be added to the labor force with our analysis? And the second being, in response to this, how will Florida's economy be impacted as a result? So tackling this first question, how many people will be added to the labor force? To, to tackle that question first, we need to look at how does a one percentage point look like, right? So from that, we gather US census data, and um, we are, were able to find the Florida 16 plus population in the year 2020, which is around 17 million people. From that, we calculated the percentage of people that report having a disability, which is 50.5%. We apply it to that 17 million, and we gather that 2.7 million Floridians, 16 and up, report having a disability. Then, this is the population that is used to calculate the labor force participation rate for people with disabilities. So just getting a one percentage point of that, we end up having 27,000 people. So something to notice that this is for the year 2020. We are trying to, our analysis starts in the year 2023. Therefore, we need to take into account things that change over time and will affect these calculations. Such things are Florida's uh, estimated population growth is in the next coming years. And we also found an increasing rate of people reporting disabilities in the state of Florida, which we also, we also took into account. As Carlos has stated, one of the biggest things that we have to do is equate everything through our 10-year analysis, starting at 2023 and going to 2032. This graph visually shows the labor force growth each for each year of our analysis over the 10 years, with the dark bars representing the overall people accumulated up to that year for each year of our analysis, and the light blue graph representing the overall people added by our analysis every single year. Something to note here, however, is that the actual value of each light bar being added is not the same throughout every year. And this is, as Carlos stated, largely due to the overall population growth trends as well as the reporting trends that occurred that we had to account in our data when we were doing our analysis. Overall, what this ultimately accumulates to after our 10-year analysis is 304,813 people with disabilities being added to the labor force for the state of Florida. And in doing this, we've accomplished our first goal in answering overall how many people are going to be added in our labor force. After finding the number of people who would need to be added to the labor force, the next part of our analysis was finding how this would impact Florida's economy. It's important to note that adding someone to the labor force does not necessarily mean that they will be employed. However, we wanted to be consistent with the Able Trust mission of helping people with disabilities to obtain meaningful employment. So our analysis makes the assumption that this nearly 305,000 people with disabilities will not just be added to the labor force, but will also be employed. To start this part of our analysis, we wanted to look at the characteristics of the labor force for people with disabilities. In many ways, it's different from the general labor force, and therefore increasing it will impact Florida's economy in a unique way. We started by looking at the breakdown of part-time and full-time employment. 38.5% of people with disabilities are employed part-time. This is over 10 percentage points greater than the figure for the general population. As a result, a higher proportion of the general population is employed full-time. To be exact, 72.8% of the general population is employed full-time compared to 61.5% of the population with disabilities. Considering this great difference in part-time and full-time work between the two populations, we knew that we wanted to look at the rest of our analysis through the lens of part-time and full-time work for people with disabilities. So we started by looking at the industry breakdown. For people with disabilities working part-time, the top three industries were retail trade. You can see that over one-fifth of people with disabilities working part-time are employed in the retail trade industry. It's also interesting to note that that's that the retail trade industry has one of the lowest mean annual incomes of every industry. Also, accommodation and food services and healthcare and social assistance were in the top three. For people with disabilities working full-time, the top three industries were healthcare and social assistance, retail trade, and construction. You'll see that retail trade and healthcare and social assistance are in the top three for both categories. However, the percentage of people working, depending if they're part-time or full-time, is different. This reinforced for us that we wanted to break down our analysis by part-time and full-time employment in order to gain a more accurate impact. So, as Sheridan pointed out, there are many characteristics that apply to, to the labor force and the difference therein. Therefore, 
um, we're going to show you how to do account for those things in the, in the data. First, we get the workers other per year, which is our, our answer from the first question. And then we divided this group into two, be it part-time and full-time employment using the proportions seen in today's labor force. Then we divided even further by sector per group, as Sheridan pointed out, these group of part-time and full-time groups tend to, tend to work at different industries at different proportions. And we took that into account in, in our data, which then we repeated for each year um, to get our you know, numbers by industry, by year, and um, part-time, full-time. So now we're, we're gonna show you a walkthrough of our analysis in the sense that our model, we use an input-output model, more specifically a software called Remy, which helps us calculate and see the multiplier effect from our initial impact to the economy, in our case, employment numbers, and how that those initial employment numbers spread out to the economy and create even more employment numbers, more impact, and you know, kind of sp it spreads out even more than that direct impact. So starting out, employment inputs per year, those people are gonna employ, they're gonna get new income, which is an income that is gonna, and it's gonna change th depending on the industry sector that they are, and that income is gonna be spent, right? So then that's an increase in the demand for consumption of these goods, which will then lead to an increase in demand of labor and capital to produce those consumption goods, which then will go back into the economy, meaning that there will be more employment numbers even beyond the initial impact, creating a feedback loop that calculates kind of the impact of the economy. Something to note is that the full-time and part-time um, disparities, the model does not take into account like part-time, therefore we have to take um, part-time people and make it a ratio of full-time. Therefore, the numbers that you're gonna see are what, what's called full-time equivalents. As a result of using this input-output model, we found there to be a sizable impact on Florida's economy if we were to accomplish the Able Trust goal. More specifically, there would be an increase of nearly 246,000 full-time workers added through direct employment, nearly 332,000 full-time workers added through indirect, induced, and dynamic employment, for a total of 578,000 full-time workers added. We also saw that there would be an increase of $53.2 billion in personal income, an increase of $1.1 billion in state tax revenue, and an increase in total economic output of $111.8 billion over the 10-year period. <coughs> the results from our initial analysis already show the value in the economic impact of achieving the Able Trust goal of reducing the gap in labor force participation between the general population and people with disabilities by one percentage point per year for 10 years. In line with this, the Able Trust have, ha have had great success using foundational programs, as we have shown, such as high school, high tech, in order to pursue this goal. With the success of these programs in mind, however, something that came up in our analysis was the question of what if these programs were to be expanded upon, particularly if people within the labor force with disabilities not only joined the labor force, but were also employed at a higher full-time rate. In this analysis, we used the full-time rate from the, we used the full-time rate for people with disabilities and increased it to <coughs> from 61.5 to 72.8 percent, which was the full-time rate for the general population within our initial analysis. Before we get into the weeds of this analysis, we want to take a look back at our initial findings that we found previously. These numbers in the black are initially what we shown you from our first analysis. Now. What if people with disabilities ended up working more full-time hours? The new values that we're having with this analysis are going to be showing up in bright blue on the screen now, with direct employment increasing to over 256,000 people, indirect, induced, and dynamic employment increasing to a new 361,000 people, leading to an overall new total employment of over 617,000 people. We also found much broader changes to the overall <coughs> economic impacts of Florida that we had looked at earlier, with a new personal income resulting to be $73.9 billion, a new impact on state tax revenue ending up being $1.2 billion, and a new overall total economic output for the state of Florida coming to over $121 billion. This marks an over $10 billion increase from our previous analysis. Now, you've had a lot of numbers thrown at you today, and something we wanted to kind of do here at the end was to kind of put everything in perspective and give a brief walkthrough of everything we talked about today. <clears throat> we have the, had the opportunity to show you how 
in uh, how we found the overall economic impact of decreasing the gap and accomplishing the able trust goal initially. We've also had the opportunity to show you if these goals were expanded, how would this new economic impact fare and what new information could we glean from it? These, both of these analyses truly show the value in accomplishing able trust goal of decreasing the labor force participation between the general population and people with disabilities by one percentage point per year for 10 years. But what this not only does within the value for us is it also directly benefits people with disabilities throughout the whole state of Florida by finding them meaningful, gainful employment, but as well as on a much broader scale, impacts the state of Florida as a whole. With that being said, we wanted to thank you for your time again, wrap up our presentation, and, look for, and we look forward to any possible questions you guys have about our work and our analysis. Thank you again. Um, I have two questions. So the first question is, how did you define disabilities or how did you define your disabled population? Um, and second, how are you assuming that every um, disabled worker entering the labor force is able to work without physical or uh, other boundaries? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, and I can start by answering that first part. So in terms of defining disability, we used ACS data um, and this is census data, and so although there's no formal definition for disability, our data defined disability through six survey questions, and each survey question um, identified a different kind of disability, so these were self-reported by people, um, and the different kinds of disability were cognitive, ambulatory, hearing or vision, independent or self-care disability, um, and you can see the different percentages of the population who reported each of those. Um, keeping in mind that people can report multiple kinds of disabilities, which is why those percentages are so high. Um, and then in terms of making the assumption that people would be entering the workforce, uh, Carlos, if you want to take that. Yeah, of course. So that is an, a, good, a good question. Um, the, because of the, uh, the pr purpose of Able Trust is making these people find meaningful employment, there are, you know, there are a variety of disabilities, right? There are many the cognitive, ambulatory, so people, you know, having issues moving. So the point is to find ways to work around these disabilities because a disability doesn't mean you are you're completely like say like that you cannot do anything. It means that there is an aspect in your life that you are not able to perform as maybe as other. But the point is to find um, any kind of job, any kind of employment that allows you to perform at your best, you know, with, without regarding your disability. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Okay. Uh, were you able to find any economic differences between uh, adding to labor force participation for disabled people versus non-disabled people? That is a good question. Um, so the model that we use does not, right, you cannot like dif differentiate between like um, being, having a disability or not. Um, here you can see, for example, uh, where is median income. So for example, in the, in the dark blue, you have the general. In the clear blue, you have the, so there are, there are difference in terms of income. So we could definitely say that um, you know, the model is not taking this into account, but there is an aspect that is not being taken care of uh, the model, and it's uh, this idea of like the caretakers that are taking care of the people with disability, which of course will range depending on the severity of the disability, but these people are now either going to be able to also work more or have more financial freedom to also be spending on the economy. So in some regards, we do think that this has been under, on, underestimating the effects of the, um, the, the effects into the economy. And also, the people with disability population is a more, um, let's say, have worse, tend, tend to have worse outcomes. So impacting them specifically can have a great effect into the economy. Since the maximum income for Medicaid in the state of Florida is $18,000 a year, did you all look at the benefits cliff of 
well, maybe I don't want to go into the workforce because then I would lose my Medicaid insurance. Did that impact into your analysis? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, uh, Kieran, if you want to. So that's a great question, actually. Um, we specifically didn't take into account that um, the possibility of, uh, of, the, of the cliff. Um, our data had very, it, it was very difficult to find um, the welfare payments to people because people under-report those in actual surveys. Therefore, we, really, we tried to take it into account, but we couldn't. But in respect to what, there is definitely a cliff there, um, hopefully with better policy, I will say. Um, realizing that this is a problem that could happen, the issue with cliffs tends to be that the cliffs are a sharp cut, right? So people will say like, oh, I'm not gonna lose my money, therefore I'm not gonna work. But, um, you know, making it a smoother transition, allowing people to smoothly transition into the workforce without losing those benefits immediately, um, you know, will be a better choice. So, but in terms of the immediate future, that's a definite possibility. Um, so yeah, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So the disabled population, we've looked into this a little bit at the Department of Economic Opportunity. They tend to be older or fall into other groups that are less likely just from a general population perspective to not participate in the workforce. Um, just keeping that in mind, how did y'all look at how reasonable that 1% per year goal might be? Or is there some, you know, given just the demographic characteristics of the disabled population, what's, what's a, a, a reasonable kind of maximum target participation rate for that group? <coughs> So that is actually a great question. Really quick before, just for my own clarity's sake, you were asking about necessarily just how feasible that 1% increase would be for the labor force growth, correct? Okay. Um, one of the big things that we actually thought about um, was when we met with uh, Allison Chase, the CEO of Able Trust. Um, we're necessarily with this project only really looking at the economic impact of accomplishing this goal, but when we met with Allison, Tr uh, Allison Chase and we talked with some of the people at <coughs> the Able Trust, one of the big things that we were looking at in asking them was, how are they necessarily going about doing this? How are they going to be accomplishing this goal? And for them, what a lot of the, what we gleaned from it was through their foundational programs such as high school high tech, through some things that we have mentioned previously, kind of starting at grassroots, going as, as young as you can, and then basically trying to build up that <coughs> labor force addition in, in a reasonable way. If you're trying to just get people into the labor force when they're older, when they've already had um, time throughout their life, it's harder to make that adjustment versus using programs such as high school, high tech that are able to target people like literally in high school and then bring them, teach them skills for either post-secondary education or to just go into the labor force. Um, there's also been work within through uh, vocational rehabilitation and other programs that the Able Trust is actually employing to make this transition and analyzing out with that respect. Did that answer your question? Okay. Let me, like, if I can add up to that, with the specific regards to, you know, is that 15% of people, maybe like a lot of them are, you know, from the other population. If we also look at other reporting for people with disabilities. And the CDC actually found that age adjusted, um, people with disabilities seems to uh, be to be around 26% with, and versus our, our, what the ACS we were able to find was 15%, so there is like a 10% gap. Um, in the ages 18 to 44, the CDC reports that it's around 19.2% of people with, with disabilities in Florida. Therefore, you know, um, there might be an ACS under reporting occurring um, which, you know, it means that there is, a, there is a possibility that our analysis, you know, it's actually an under, under, under reporting, it's, you know. Hey, thanks for that presentation. Just kind of going back to the welfare cliff question that was asked a little bit ago from, I guess, another side of that. 
of people not opting into the program or, or joining the labor force, but also these people are in some way interacting with the economy and there's some sort of income coming in, whether it's from um, government benefits or otherwise. So was there any margining, because it kind of went from the employment to new income to increased demand, so margining that new income from what they're currently receiving compared to what they would receive entering the labor force? Let me see if I understand. From the income figures that we have from like that bid results table, like you're asking whether we took into account the lost payments of welfare that are gonna... Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So those income numbers are a combination of both, you know, the direct, those, the, the, the people with disabilities joining the labor force and getting more income, and also, you know, the people beyond, you know, from the demand, from the increase in demand and consumption and the new employment numbers getting into. So that is not only them getting the, that money, but it's also like the economy as a whole. Of course, the subsidies that they're getting right now, they play a factor, right? Um, but, you want to there is a val there is a uh, increased value in that new income that uh, people with disabilities entering the labor force would be receiving. Um, as Carlos was saying, there is obviously multiplicative effects from this that we have analyzed within our model. Um, but the value that they're coming in from the labor force is necessarily what we are primarily analyzing, and just the economic impact of them actually getting jobs into the labor force and uh, assuming employment. Yeah, yeah, we have time for one more. Thank you. If, if I heard your description of what counts as a disability, it was a self-report on that, not necessarily uh, any social benefits that were being paid out to the individual. So that, that comes into part of the analysis. And the second part, you may, something to consider as you go forward is greater propulsion that could come into the multiplier effect when you think that some of the barriers have nothing to do with the person with disabilities, but the perceptions that the employers have of the disability and that everybody is incapable of work. So socializing or having more people in the workforce would actually accelerate the hiring of other individuals with disability potentially. So something to consider as you go forward. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Thank you. Yeah, no, no. Uh, thank you for that comment. Yeah, no, that's something that we have definitely like thought about because and as Kiran said before, like the targeting of the of this like issue, this disparity earlier from like high school, for example, like trying to uh, prepare these people to enter the labor force, preparing these people to get a post-secondary education. If we get them the skills early, like, you know, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a much smoother way, a smoother transition into better outcomes for them. So yeah, thank you, thank you for that addition. Great, thank you guys. All right, our last group is assessing the fiscal impact of sea level rise in Florida. So Florida is world renowned for its white sandy beaches and its beautiful oceanfront communities. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the sea level is expected to rise up to two feet by the year 2050. With this rise in sea level, these communities and beaches are expected to face chronic inundation. My name is Zach Morby. These are my colleagues, Harry Hewson and Nikesh Patel. We are here on behalf of AERG to discuss the fiscal impact of the sea level rise to the state of Florida's budget. In order to do this, we focus on two main funding sources, property tax revenue and sales tax revenue. By calculating the property tax revenue loss and the sales tax revenue loss, we can calculate the total loss of taxes to the state. To get a better understanding of how we calculate the property tax loss, let's walk through two examples that demonstrate this process in its entirety. We began by loading in property data from the Florida Department of Revenue into the mapping software ArcGIS, as shown here by these properties in St. Petersburg. By overlaying this with NOAA's data on sea level rise, 
we can visualize how these impact, how this sea level rise will impact these properties. Let's take a look and see what happens to these properties at two feet of sea level rise. So the water comes up from the bay and begins to flood both, both these properties and the surrounding neighbors. Zooming in on the property on the top left, excuse me, the top right, we can start to under, we can get a better idea of what happens to this property as, it, as the sea level begins to rise. This orange block right here indicates the area of the property that is completely lost, though it looks like the improvement itself is gone. This calculated area turns out to be 64% of the entire property, which with an evaluation of $1.2 million is a roughly $800,000 value lost to this particular property, which is then a $15,000 annual property tax loss to St. Petersburg. So let's take a look into a bigger perspective and also we can be able to then calculate on, on how we then calculate the property tax loss. So our second example is in Delray Beach in Palm Beach County. So we see here the parcel information data from the FDOR, and then we're gonna see the NOAA predictive sea level overlay. So as shown here, we see the inundation that would occur from the canal that, would lead, that leads in from the Atlantic Ocean. So to first calculate the actual market value loss, we would use that orange polygon or that orange area that Harry mentioned previously, and we multiply that by, we collect by the just value that we collect from the FDOR. To then calculate the property tax loss, we'd use that market value loss and multiply that by every individual's parcel's average county millage rate. And then we can finally sum them all up to get the total property tax loss to all local and county governments statewide. So we can take a deeper look into a specific neighborhood in Delray Beach. So in this uh, neighborhood, there's 17 parcels. And out of those 17 parcels, three of them are multi-family multi apartment type housing. And out of those 17, 11 of them appear to be fully inundated, while another four of them appear to be at least partially inundated. The value of this neighborhood is about $45 million. But because of the inundation that would occur, there's a $33 million loss to this neighborhood. So we'd use that $33 million and we'd multiply it by Palm Beach County's average millage rate. And then we can calculate that there is a $620,000 property tax loss annually just to this neighborhood alone. Applying this methodology across the entire state, you can start to see why and how sea level rise will impact the state of Florida. Shown here is a map of Florida generated by ArcGIS. The black outlines, outline surrounding the state is, our, is an indication of areas that will be impacted by two feet of sea level rise. The red highlighted sections indicate areas that will feature high density inundation. In other words, there are a lot of properties that will feature a lot of, that'll be featuring a lot of inundation. Coastal counties are not the only places that we are impacted by sea level rise. Areas such as Jacksonville and counties located near the St. Johns River will be facing the same level of inundation that places such as Vero Beach, Fort Myers, and Pensacola will be seeing across the state. Moving on to, state, moving on to statewide, over 520,000 properties will be impacted by, by this inundation, which is about $47 billion in value lost to the state of Florida. Of these properties, over 15% will be inundated at, by at least 50% or more which is about 80,000 properties statewide. So Florida's desirable beaches attract millions of visitors and new residents each year. These visitors and residents spend hundreds of billions of dollars and are responsible for tens of billions of dollars of sales tax revenue. In calendar year 2021, the state collected almost $29 billion in sales tax revenue across its 67 counties. In order to estimate the impact of sea level rise on the sales tax revenue, we estimate the relationship between sales tax revenue and Florida's high quality beaches. To do this, we take uh, FDOR data on sales tax revenue in each county from the years 2017 to 2021. We also look at Sandy Beach data of miles of Sandy Beach in each county. And we account for other factors that may influence sales tax revenue uh, at the county level, such as population, median household income, and industry uh, distribution by worker participation. 
Using this data, we are able to estimate the marginal impact of a mile of Sandy Beach on a county's sales tax revenue. We estimate that for every mile of Sandy Beach a county has, they can expect their sales tax revenue to be 0.7% higher than if those beaches had not existed. Using this marginal impact estimation, we can compare the actual sales tax revenue against an estimated sales tax revenue. The actual sales tax revenue is showing up in green on the screen right now. The estimated sales tax revenue will be shown in blue below. The estimated sales tax revenue represents what the sales tax revenue would have been in each year if the sea level rise had already occurred and Florida's beaches had already been impacted. In order to account for this impact on sandy beaches, we take the Florida Department of Environmental Protection's estimates for critically eroded beaches in the state of Florida and work under the assumption that all critically eroded beaches will be lost due to two feet of sea level rise. Once we find this estimated sales tax revenue, we can then find the difference between the actual sales tax revenue in each of those years and the estimated sales tax revenue to find the total sales tax revenue loss to the state. So by looking at both the property tax approach as well as the sales tax approach, we can then calculate the total loss to the state of Florida. On the property tax side, Florida is predicted to lose $735 million annually. And with sales tax, they're going to lose about $3 billion annually, which would give us a total of $3.7 billion yearly. So if we see on this heat map to the left, uh, we can see the relationships between the total tax loss of each region. As the color of the red goes darker, that would indicate a higher impact to that specific region. So let's, get, let's go ahead and take a deeper look into some of these regions. An area that will be less impacted by sea level rise is the Big Bend. With its lower millage rates and lower property values than the rest of the region in Florida, it will still see a $20 million property tax loss annually. And with fewer beaches than anywhere else in the state of Florida, they will still, they will still lose over $350,000 in sales tax annually. Altogether, this is a $20.4 million tax loss to this region each and every year. So given the fact that the Big Bend is on the low end of total loss, while the Southeast region is on the high end of total loss, the Southeast region has the highest population give, uh, comparative to all the other regions in Florida with counties like Miami-Dade, Palm Beach, and Broward counties um, as well. And because of the Southeast region having higher property values as well as higher millage rates comparative to uh, the Big Bend, the region is going to lose $239 million in property taxes. And because of its high population and high tourism, as well as low elevations in the Southeast region, the region is going to lose $1.5 billion um, yearly. And this would give us that total of $1.8 billion annually just to the Southeast region. And so we've talked about the Big Bend, and we've talked about the Southeast, re Southeast region. So let's go ahead and look at the other five regions of Florida. So the range is from $200 million to almost $600 million in total tax loss within the regions. We can see that where the Gulf Coast is on the central west and the southwest region of Florida have higher impacts comparative to the Atlantic e regions like the northeast and the central east regions. This is mainly because of those population differences and um, elevation differences to where the, the Gulf Coast is going to experience a higher amount of total loss comparative to the Atlantic. So although property taxes are collected at the county level, they still have an impact on the state budget due to the fact that the state is partially responsible for funding education. So as we mentioned earlier, we estimate that the state will see a $735 million property tax loss across its 67 counties. In order to calculate the school funding gap that will occur from this uh, property tax loss, we multiply the property tax loss in each community and each county by the percentage of property taxes that go to the school board in that county. By doing this, we find that the state will see a school funding gap of approximately $294 million per year. To qualify this school funding gap, we compare it against the average funding for a full-time student in a public school in the state of Florida. According to our research, the average student costs around $7,800 per school year to fund their education. By dividing this number by the total funding gap, we see that local counties will struggle to fund schooling for up to 38,000 students yearly. 
So the state of Florida is expected to see up to $3.7 billion in tax loss each year starting in the year 2050. Over the first 10 years between 2050 and 2060, that is a total of $28 billion in tax revenue lost to the state. So this tax loss doesn't just impact the state budget. If that school funding gap discussed on the previous slide is not closed, this tax revenue loss has the uh, ability to impact the future of Florida's students. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, my name is Zach, Harry, and Akash. We'd like to answer them. Because we're economists, we're supposed to ask these callous questions. But I, I just wonder um, if you've considered all this extra um, waterfront property that we would gain <laughs> and what the value of it would do. And I kind of have a throwaway question to go along with it. And that is, I don't know why you picked two feet, but uh, I guess just having grown up at the source of the St. John's River, is the ocean going to go up the river? Just kind of wondering about the hydrology. Okay, so I'll answer the second part of your question first. When NOAA predicted their, predicted it, they actually created a range. It was one to two feet of sea level rise across the state of Florida by the year 2050. When they calculated this, they did account for the Atlantic Ocean, which feeds into the St. John's River. That would still overflow to a fairly significant degree, which is why when you saw on that heat map, some areas in St. John's would see a lot of inundation and therefore a lot of property value loss. So going back to your first question about would there be more property, more waterfront property created, it is difficult to say. To get a better idea of why we use the just value, we ultimately use this because it's a reference point that's effectively the market value. Uh, a lot of markets, this will, a lot of this will happen once the market starts to see this. So a better question I would, I would ask is, if you see your neighbor's house is getting flooded, is your house now property, waterfront property, or is it at risk of further damage? I've moved from frequent flyer to helium hand. Uh, okay. Um, sort of a related question to the earlier one is if, if uh, all these properties get flooded, due to sea level rise, and uh, homeowners look to their insurance companies to reimburse them at uh, the replacement cost, which they would expect to get. Um, wouldn't they, would they move, would 100% of these individuals move out of Florida, or would they reinvest in Florida, and thereby kind of like have an offset to this uh, revenue loss that we're talking about, where they would move someplace else and, and, and more uh, revenue would be generated as a result. Tax revenue would be generated as a result. Did you did you look at that um, uh, possible offset to the to the losses that were discussed? Yeah. So we did look at quite a few um, potential offsets, and what we realized is that there's just not data available for people's preferences because this would be an event that had not been seen um, since modern re research has started. So we just did not have access to data to estimate um, what those offsets would be. Although we do recognize that that there is potential to offset there. First of all, great presentation. Um, I know y'all looked at the impact of, of tourism um, and maybe a decrease of it in, in terms of sales tax. Did y'all look at potential loss in revenues from toll roads? Toll roads. Uh, we ultimately did not. There are there are uh, there was limited data available to us when we when we made this. However, uh, it was also difficult to quantify the impact that to that roads at large would have to the state of Florida. In that initial example in St. Petersburg, the water, to be, to be clear to the audience here, is not just popping over for a quick, not, not knocking at the neighbor's door and just skipping the road entirely, it's also taking out the entire road. There is this isolation effect that would happen to a lot of places that we found difficult to quantify. In other words, some properties might only be a fraction inundated, but that fraction is actually the entire improvement. Alternatively, the entire property could be wiped out, but because this house is on stilts, uh, it would not be effective effectively. So, roads were not con no, roads were not considered. Uh, additionally, bridges were not considered either, uh, for sim for similar reasons as different companies have different building building standards to how they do codes. 
and such is it such is life, I suppose. So I just want to I just want to add on to that, and that's kind of also why we use the just value, just because of the fact that um, we don't know. So given the spatial files that we load in Map into ArcGIS, we don't know where the improvement is or the property is on a certain given parcel, um, just because of the fact it's just how it's mapped. Um, so that is why we're given we're using that just value. So it's either like we're take, trying to take an account for maybe a possible future improvement that could be um, on that land. So. Did y'all think about any byproducts of the increased um, salt water that might be, you know, financially beneficial to the state of Florida? Um, first part and then second part. Uh, any any thought about the cost to mitigate some of the the um, rise as far as like seawalls, things of that nature. I just want to clarify the, your first part of the question regarding um, if we looked into impacts or effects from like the seawater rising and the salt the salt water into the no. um, coast. Value as far as like desalinization of water, is there any way that you can make, the state can make money off of something like that? Um, so it's definitely a negative, right, for the seawater to rise, but are there any positives associated with it, that, you know, that might be financially beneficial? So we did uh, talk a little more into our appendix, in our appendix of our report. However, we didn't think about more of like the positive side of, um, you know, just with your question but we did talk about more of the negative um, attributes that would occur from that, as you're saying. And then to your second question about mitigation, um, we did consider that very early on. Uh, we realized that there's just not enough data available to properly account for all of the mitigation efforts that are either in place now or would be put into place and how that would affect the analysis that we actually did do. So this is a worst case scenario if no mitigation efforts were put into place analysis. The, um, the Florida, Florida also just passed just like in July, this past fiscal year, um, the Florida Statewide Resiliency Plan, I think it's about $220 million, I believe, 270, $270 million, they're putting in state mitigation. Um, because of, being, of it being fairly new, we can't estimate properly, like, we can't estimate properly how that mitigation efforts and the money and the cost of that mitigation would impact in the future. And then one more thing to add to that is that currently mitigation efforts are almost exclusively at the county level. The state funds grant programs to the counties, but as far as the state implementing actual mitigation efforts, um, they largely rely on the local areas to take care of that. Um, so just accounting for areas that do or don't do that that are near each other, it's really hard to estimate how a total mitigation effort by the state um, would be different from these individual mitigation efforts that are sp sparse throughout the state. And so finally, if you look at In the um, course of your research, did you guys uh, do any sort of analysis or, or have any conversations about the potential impact of this conversation even occurring? So the fact that more and more land now is not insurable, the fact that property is not being developed because it's at risk, uh, was that something you guys uh, took into consideration? So we actually did uh, speak to, I don't know if he's here today, but Jeffrey Sharkey, um, and he is currently working with a group that is working with the insurance companies on how that would impact the state. Um, he was not able to share their research yet with us because it is still in the research phase and is a proprietary to that research facility. Um, that is something we considered, but we did not have access to that data to fully analyze it. Other questions for the group? All right, let's give them and all the groups a round of applause. All right, a big um, congratulations to our graduates.
All right, y'all, so there's food and drinks right outside the room. Um, please stick around. We are going to um, tabulate, so finish your judging if you haven't done that yet. Um, so in the, I mentioned this in the folder, the, um, the, the uh, password on the QR code is actually M A E P 2022, all one word, all lowercase. Um, so go ahead and give our teams our your comments and everything, and then we have drinks and food in the back for y'all. And then once we tabulate the results, we'll call everybody back in and we'll present our awards.
Thank you. Yes, that will be fantastic.
All right, if y'all could come back in, please. Grab a, I heard one of the alumni call it a roadie, and bring it back in here, though, instead of actually hitting the road, that would be great. All right, are we all back in? All right, um, thank you all for coming today. I do really appreciate it. I appreciate your support of the program and of our students. It means a ton to me, it means a ton to our students, it means a ton to our faculty members, it means a lot to our staff as well. So thank you, thank you everybody too who contributed. Um, the community partners, faculty members, staff, uh, alumni of course, thank you guys so much for your continued involvement in the program. Um, the first award that I want to present is um, for outstanding student. So this happens to be the student with the highest GPA throughout the program. Um, I actually have worked with her since she was an undergraduate student. Um, I can attest that she's not only a very hardworking and high performing student, um, you know, with a top notch GPA, but she's also just a pleasure to work with. Um, her team members report that she is a pleasure to work with. Um, she, you know, works well with others. Um, she's a, you know, a, a pleasure to socialize with. Um, she's just an, an outstanding individual in, in addition to being an outstanding student. Um, Sheridan Meek, come on up. And then our award for um, best applied project. So y'all um, voted and um, we tallied the results. And of course it was pretty close, uh, but we did have one group that uh, nudged out the rest and that is uh, Jackson County. Congratulations. So congratulations to Mike Margolis, Abigail Morgan, and Will Stevenson.
When do y'all when do y'all present to the county? Tuesday. They present to the county, the Jackson County on Tuesday, their findings. So again, people are are really interested in, in our, our students' research and we're really proud of them. One more last a, a round of applause. All right, so we've got um, food and drinks. Y'all are welcome to hang out and stuff. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for attending today.